this here. What do you guys? What do you guys think this is? This looks like pot. It's, it's like petai. Petai. So oh. it actually comes in oh. these uh, pods. pods. Hi, I'm Shabir and you're watching The Library Report, where we discover little-known aspects of our very own libraries and investigate the fascinating people who work behind the scenes. In this episode, join me as I meet with a librarian whose job isn't just about collecting books, but also print and digital material such as photographs, videos and social media archives of fast-disappearing memories and local knowledge. I'll also be talking to a culinary anthropologist with a passion for traditional ingredients. Today, we look into one of my favourite parts of Singapore's culture, food. We all love food, but how much do we really know about ingredients that are indigenous to Singapore? Do we even have any indigenous ingredients? Let's talk to our guests and find out. Hi Georgina, hi Nitya. Thank you so much for taking time out to join me today. Could you tell me more about what you do and uh, tell me more about yourselves? Hi I'm Nitya, I'm a culinary anthropologist. Um, I run Brunch Bandits, which is a pop-up dining club. I also run uh, Singapore Seed Exchange, which is all about creating equitable access to native edible plant seeds. I'm Georgina, I'm a librarian with the National Library and I'm involved in the project team that's doing contemporary collecting. So this is an initiative by the library to collect the political, social, cultural landscape of Singapore. And one of our current collecting focuses is on contemporary food culture. So I'm very interested in what Nitya has to say today. Yeah, let's get started with that. So Nitya, I hear that you know, you're a bit of an advocate for locally grown produce, right? Mm. So uh, could you tell me more about that? I think being in Singapore, you know, precisely because of our history and where we are geographically, um, a lot of our, the way we look at things is outward facing. So we know a lot about ingredients from Japan, from France, from Australia, you know, like we know so much about that. But when it comes to local plants, indigenous plants, um, I don't really think for a long time we saw the value mm. in them. So with my work is to put a new lens, a more fun kind of perspective on what um, local plants can be, what they can be for us in our day-to-day -day lives. Yeah, and it's really interesting because your work is all about educating people about local plants and how to use them, and this is the kind of knowledge that is really easy to disappear from our collective consciousness and exactly what the library would like to collect. I'm curious to know why our uh, traditional culinary practices seen as being at risk of disappearing. I mean, Singapore is a nation of food lovers, right? That is one part of our heritage that should stand the test of time. As Singapore becomes, I mean, it's, it's a mega city, right? And family units are changing. So, you know, before, well, you might have multi-generational homes in one place and you cook for 8 to 15 people. Now you have three or one. You know, like units are smaller. So that's like to make a rendang from scratch or to make a laksa from scratch are not very practical. And so most people are turning towards pre-mixed. Uh, so, you know, you want to cook chicken curry, you go and get a pre-mix. Uh, you want to cook rendang or you want to cook laksa, you get a pre-mix. But what that does is it homogenizes flavor. You know, before each household will have its own version of chicken curry. But now, there's only one version of I was chicken. Taste the same exactly. Too. So, I think you won't lose those dishes, but you will lose that intangible nuance in flavour. That disappears. Mm. And what do you think can be done to preserve our food culture and tradition? Well, I mean, a lot of what is already being done is in the contemporary food scene. I think people like Nithya are doing great work in that they're reincorporating a lot of native plants and traditional cooking methods into their food, you know, doing different kinds of fusion experiments. And it's basically the library's job to collect the work that they're doing. So I think this would be really good for future generations or even now researchers wanting to look at the food scene. They have one place to look into all that information. And this is part of an ongoing effort to document Singapore's heritage. Yes, so the National Library is engaging in contemporary collecting where, you know, instead of waiting 50 years for things to get forgotten and lost, we proactively collect. So we're looking for things like print material, because we're the library, um, brochures, posters, all these kinds of things. We're also looking at digital materials, so people's social media archives, their websites, blogs, magazines and designs that have been produced online. We collect all of those things into our repository so that they can be available for current and future generations. How do you source the materials? 
So we do this in two ways. The first way is by targeted collecting. So we approach individuals or organizations who are very active in the scene that they're in, um, people who are spearheading interesting projects, and we approach them directly to collect their materials. But another very exciting way that we're trying out is we have now a open public call for um, contributions to the library. So we've got two calls open at the moment, one on youth culture, it's called Young Singapore, and one on food culture, which is called Singapore Makan. So from now into 2024, we're actually going to put out a series of open calls where the public is invited to contribute their memories, their information and their materials to our online platform called Singapore Memory. You know, their own stories can be documented as part of Singapore's heritage. And for today, I'm actually really interested in what Nitya has to show us about native plants. So Yeah, I mean, uh, could you show us some examples of these uh, local breeds? So I have a few of them growing on my little rooftop garden, so follow me. Alright. So I wanted to show you, start off with this, which is the Moringa plant. Right. That's the one that you make, the, do you get the drumstick from? Yes, yes, yes. Ah, yeah, it's very popular in Indian cuisine. Yeah, so I mean, I think in for South Indian culture, it's called Moringa Kiret. Yes, yes. Uh, or Moringa Kai for the drumstick pots. The Filipinas use it as well, they call it Malungge, mm -hmm. which is also used a lot in their cuisines. Uh, you would see it now as a superfood powder, uh, you know, for many times the price. Uh, so you can get fresh leaves still in the markets. Um, but it tastes very different when you grow them. Mm. And this is something else that we're going to be using today, which is the wild pepper leaf. Mm. It's called down kadut. Down. You might recognize this because oh. uh, it's very popular in Singapore as a ground cover. Right. Oh. So it grows everywhere. Uh, so this one used to be used traditionally for ota. Oh. I see. So when you use ota, when you use the coconut leaf or the banana leaf, you put this on the inside because it complements uh, fish really well. And this uh, is Ulam Raja. Ulam Raja. So it's called the King Salad. Yeah. So this is becoming very popular in Singapore at the moment because it's got a bit of a green mango flavour. Most Singaporeans would have no idea about these herbs, you know, because we don't find them in the supermarket or on our dinner table, right? How did you learn so much about them? So it's quite cliche, right? Um, I think now most chefs and most people will say they were inspired by their grandparents and so was I. A lot of the knowledge that I have about indigenous plants was kind of absorbed subliminally from my grandparents who had a lot of this knowledge. I met a lot of uh, cooks, a lot of growers um, and they share little tips. So that's what food is, right? It's kind of an edible cultural history. So how do we keep this kind of generational knowledge from dying out? It's oral history, right? So it's passing it on to the next generation. So Georgina, how can we prevent these plants from disappearing from our culinary landscape? Right, I think a lot of the great work that is actually being done by people like Nitya and by folks who are you know, growing in farms locally and who are incorporating it more into their food, what's key for the library is to document all of their efforts and you know, to get as much information as possible accessible to the public. So if folks want to explore on their own, they know where they can find a source of information. Back then, you know, two generations ago, you know, even if you have a little bit of space, there will be a pot of something going yeah, there, yeah, yeah. right? You know, your curry leaf, yeah. your basil, your chili patty. Mm -hmm. So imagine you grow Thai basil and chili patty, mm -hmm. and your neighbor grows moringa mm -hmm. and uh, perhaps laksa leaf. Mm -hmm. You know, then you guys can swap. So food builds community, right? Mm -hmm. And if you grow, you're going to want to cook. Yeah. So I would say just start planting. So we're going to harvest some plants and we're going to make something. All right, let's go. All right, let's go. let's make it together. Okay, let's go. So we're going to make a pesto. Uh, pesto? Yes. Isn't that supposed to be like a Western condiment? I thought <laughs> we were going to make something local. Well, it's local in terms of the ingredients that we're using. Pesto itself, I think, you know, we have our own versions in Asia, mm. right? We have, uh, I think the Indians have something called a toyo or a chutney. Uh, you have sambals, you know, there's all these variations which are really similar to a pesto. Mm. It's just grinding down some herbs. Yep. And uh, so the herbs we're using are from the garden. Um, I think you guys saw a few earlier, yes. some of these. We picked these also, right? Yes, yeah. so, but the kind of the herbs are very similar to what also goes into a nasi ulam. Mm. So it's like an ulam pesto. So it's also seasonal. So yeah. I'm just using stuff that's like available. So even with the nuts that we use, right, traditionally for the Italian style pesto, you use pine nuts. Um, but here I'm going to use a variety of nuts that are easily available and affordable mm. for Asia. So I've got some ground, um, some roasted ground nuts. 
and I'm gonna put a few of them in there. And then some cashews, not necessary. If you have some around, you know, we always have cashews around as yep. snacks. So yep. just use some leftover ones, especially if like the air goes into it and you don't know what to do with it. And you can use it for this? Just use it for, wow. just use it for okay. pesto. Okay. Uh, so I've also got bois caras. Okay. Which is, Walk us. It's called candle nut. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's a base yeah. of a lot of our rempas and stuff mm. like that. So I'm putting a few of those in. You can toast it as well before okay. uh, doing it. Mm -hmm. um, I've got some garlic. I've roasted it a little bit. Mm. Okay. This here. What do you guys what do you guys think this is? It's, it's like pot. It's like it's patai. Patai. So yeah. it actually comes in Ooh. these uh, pods. pods. Okay. So right. it's called stinky bean for a reason. Okay. But I think it adds quite a nice flavor. Oh, I love sambal patai. Yeah, yeah. It's one of the best things, yeah. <laughs> so I guess you guys will like this. Um, I'm gonna add a little bit of chili padi. Okay. okay. So it's a This chili padi looks like slightly different. It's, it's like a Thai small. or local right. from this region. So okay. it's very small, it's very spicy, so I'm only going to put a few. Okay. So that's that for the base, right? Um, so I have some cheese. Uh, you can use Parmigiano, you can use uh, kind of a mature cheddar, up to you. Uh -huh. You can also completely keep it vegan and not add any cheese. Okay. okay. Right, it's not necessary. Yeah, it's very flexible. So in the herbs, right, I have added in some laksa leaves, some Thai basil, um, some moringa. Mm. Um, as well as wild pepper leaves, mm -hmm. and then of course Ulam Raja. So I'm also adding some olive oil here. Okay. Um, you can also play around with a couple of other more regional uh, cold pressed oils. Okay. So like sesame, mm. uh, even groundnut oil. You can also just use water. Mm. Okay. okay. But it'll have a very different texture. Understood. So that's it, right? Just put everything in, and now we're going to blitz it. Mm. Super straightforward. Right. Okay, so let's go. So I think it's done. Um, just get this off. So now the real test, we have to taste it. Oh, yes. <laughs> My favourite part, yeah. <laughs> Let's go. So, you know, you, we've used these herbs for a pesto. Oh yeah, please help yourself. Mm -hmm. um, but you can also use these herbs in so many different ways. You know, I've used Mexican tarragon and lemon balm to make shortbread cookies, mm. um, which are, is beautiful, it's so fragrant. There's just so much you can do. Possibilities. Yes. Yeah. And it takes like five to ten minutes. Mm to do these things. All right, now it's time to taste. Yes. It's the verdict. <laughs> <laughs> I better help myself to one. Mmm. So. Yeah? yeah? It's like spectacular. Like all the flavors like bursting in mm. together. Like I would believe this is from Singapore. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah so that's the coolest part about it. Mm. Even as our local food culture may become increasingly homogenized, we can still reconnect with forgotten traditional flavors through incorporating ingredients like homegrown edible greens. If you're interested in helping to preserve all things Singaporean for future generations, why not get involved in the library's contemporary collecting initiative? Just click on the link in the description to find out more. In the meantime, thanks for watching this episode of The Library Report. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like and leave a comment about other projects at NLB that you'd like to know more about. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell to get notified next time when we upload a video. See you soon.